is Jesus. Well, we've been talking about how God's revealed himself through the creation, through his written word, but he's revealed himself most deeply and most profoundly through Jesus Christ. And so if we wanna know who God is, what God is like, who he is like, we put our eyes on Jesus, we fix our eyes on him because he is God incarnate. He's God in the flesh. He disrobed himself of all his glory, yet he still remained God that the creator of the universe, this awesome, all-powerful, all-knowing creator became part of the creation. Very simply, Jesus is God. He is God with two distinct natures. He never lost any of his divinity. He never became any less God, but at the same time became fully human so that he can, as the passage tells us, identify with what it means to be human. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ impacts and affects our lives for the better. The life, the thoughts, the attitudes, the behaviors of Jesus Christ now can not only be known, but they can become part of who we are. His gentleness, his kindness, his ability to forgive others are all available to us because of his coming to earth and being resurrected on our behalf. There's some who know him as a great moral teacher, as the greatest figure in all of history. There are some who are interested in him and his ways for their own health and their own prosperity. But the question that Jesus asked Peter is the question that's relevant for all of us. Who do you say that I am? Peter's answer, you are the Christ, the promised one, the son of the living God. Paul says in Philippians chapter two that we should learn who Jesus was and what he did and the example he set before us for our own lives. So it's important that we don't just know Jesus as some historical figure that we study, but as the one who brings life and the one who helps us to know how life is worth living. So if you take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2, today uh, we are in uh, week 2 of looking at the Trinity, a week uh, 4 of our series overall on our Transforming Truth Theological Foundations. Uh, and so today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 11 in just a few moments. But before we get there, um, as a kid, I remember the excitement of taking a field trip. Anybody out there love field trips? Children, students, parents, did any of you love taking field trips? Yes, all right? Now, I know you have your hands in the air because you are experiential learners, right? You really look forward to how you are going to learn some things. Or let's be honest, we're just looking forward to a day out of the classroom, right? Okay, yeah, okay, thank you, I see that hand. Yes, thank you, all right? Uh, we all enjoyed those experiences. And yeah, some of it was they were unforgettable, but some of it was we had a change to the routine. And as a kid growing up in Southern Illinois, uh, when we were in eighth grade, you got to take the big field trip to Chicago. Uh, I had never seen buildings that big before. Uh, we went to these incredible places like the Shedd Aquarium or there along Lake Michigan, the Adler Planetarium. Uh, we got to uh, see the, the Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, me and my friends were so overwhelmed that all we needed to do was play tag, right, inside these museums. Like, we, you know, we just totally blew our minds uh, to try to take it all in at one time. But those experiences stick with you. Uh, they shape you. And it was interesting because Jesus took his disciples on some field trips as well. In Matthew chapter 16, there's a story. It says, when they came to the region or the district of Caesarea Philippi. And we read that and we think that's just another one of these little villages. But it wasn't. Now, the disciples mostly came from these little villages where Jesus had centered his ministry just north of the Sea of Galilee. But Caesarea Philippi was another kind of town altogether. Constructed by the Romans, uh, it was kind of a getaway. It was a very urban city. Uh, it was ba at the base of Mount Hermon, and it was a place that many people would come to vacation. It was almost the Las Vegas of northern Israel of its day. I want to show you a picture of what the artists, what they said it would have looked like. And you can see for these uh, country boys, so to speak, that this city would have been overwhelming to them with all of its sights and sounds and colors. And there at the base of the mountain, you can kind of see the rock outcropping there, uh, where houses and temples of worship. And so this next slide shows you what it looks like today. Of course, these buildings gone, the city long uh, vanished. 
But here were these places where people would come to worship their gods, whatever they might be. To the left, behind those bushes there, behind those trees, was a temple that was constructed to Caesar Augustus so people could worship the emperor. There, the cave that you see is literally called the gates of hell. It was a place of Baal worship where centuries before even human sacrifice had been practiced. So if you wanted to worship your pagan god, that was where you went. To the right of that was called the Grotto of Pan. And so that was a place where the Greek god Pan was worshipped. So when you came on your little vacation to get away from it all, you'll see the beautiful waterfalls, also very unusual for Israel. Uh, This is where the runoff snow, where it melted and came down Mount Hermon and then eventually forms the headwaters of the Jordan River. It was a great place to vacation. You could have it all. You could watch your parade. You could relax in the streams of Banias, and you could worship your God, whatever he was. Caesar, pagan gods, Greek gods, it was all there for you. And it's against that backdrop that Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? Well, some say that you're John the Baptist or you're Elijah come again or you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And Jesus says, but the real question is this, who do you say that I am? Imagine this backdrop there again as the disciples are just taking all of this in. Was it the Roman culture? Is it the Roman emperor? Is it the pagan worship? Is it the Greek gods? And all of that, Peter is the one to pipe up and says, you are the Messiah, the promised one, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, you're right, and that's good. You are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you see it, the word picture? That for those who declare that Jesus is God, that he is the son of God, that he is the promised one, that's the foundation, the declaration of faith that then Jesus uses to build his church and to build his kingdom. The first Christians, They spent a lot of time worshiping and declaring who Jesus was. Why? Because that same truth that applies for us now, 2,000 years later, was true then. Your decision about Jesus, who you believe him to be, and how you choose to build your life upon him means everything. So today we're going to see how the early church worshiped Jesus, how they knew him. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from Philippians chapter two, verses one through 11. And Paul writes, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. By thinking the same way, having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So make your attitude that of Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him And gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Father, because we believe. Because we believe that our life and our destiny hinges on how we respond to that question. Who do you say that I am? I pray today that as Cliff mentioned earlier, you would give us a clearer picture of who Jesus, the Son of God, truly is. 
But Father, we would push out of our minds our own preconceived notions, God, the cultural pictures that are embedded there. And instead, we would submit ourselves to your word so that we would not just know about you, but so that we could know you through Jesus. Father, thank you for sending him to us when we could not get to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. It's interesting to think about the way that people have tried to answer that question, who is Jesus, in the last couple of thousand years. Of course, there are people who try to study it through the lens of history. And what's fascinating is even scholars who are not followers of Jesus Christ talk about the indescribable and, and, and without a doubt the impact that he's had uh, on our Western civilization and in our culture. But Yale's leading historian, for one, has a quote in which he says that if it was possible to devise some kind of super magnet, and you go back over the last 2,000 years of history with that magnet, and you pull out every shred of anything related to Jesus of Nazareth, you wouldn't have very much left, would you? It's fascinating that when people begin to think about his influence on all different arenas of life, John Ortberg writes this in his book, Who Is This Man? He says, Jesus never had children, but children would be thought of differently because his followers would remember what he said about them. Jesus never married, but his treatment of women led to a record number of women who followed him and eventually to suffrage and equality movements. He never wrote a book, and yet the call to love God with all of your mind was the foundation for libraries, guilds, and eventually universities. He never led an army or held an office, and yet his movement would one day end emperor worship, serve as the foundation for documents like the Magna Carta and the Declaration of Independence, and it would fuel the abolitionist movement. There are all different ways that our culture tries to take Jesus and use him. I'm always amazed when it comes award season time that you have these actors and actresses or uh, people who are musicians and they get up and they say, I want to thank Jesus for helping me win this award. And then they go on to talk about things that are anything but godly, right? Especially with their lives, like he's some kind of good luck charm that if you just mention his name, then suddenly you're blessed. We can make fun of that, but sometimes we do the same thing in our own life, that we pick and choose what we like of what Jesus has to say, and we kind of push the rest of it to the side. There's all kinds of challenges we have as we try to push out of our minds kind of the cultural constructs that are there about Jesus. There are scholars who devote their lives, believe it or not, to trying to understand what the historical Jesus truly was. The height of liberal scholarship in the 1980s, there's a group formed called the Jesus Seminar. And I'm not making this stuff up. This is a group of guys who get together a couple times a room, they sit in a, a couple times a year, and they sit in a room and they vote on what Jesus said or didn't say, what he did or what he didn't do. They have color coded cards red if you really did it, pink if maybe he did it, uh, gray if you're skeptical, and black if you're sure that Jesus didn't do it. Uh, they finally published a book in which they cut out 82% of the Gospels, right? I don't know about you, but I'm not very interested in a bunch of guys sitting in a room telling me what Jesus did or said. Instead, I'm interested in the original Jesus. I'm interested in the Jesus of Scripture. We have to go back there time and time again. I want to put a quote up on the screen for you from a 16th century theologian. He didn't get everything right, but he got this right. His name was Erasmus. He says, the Bible will give Christ to you in an intimacy so close that he would be less visible to you if he stood before your eyes. Think about that. God has preserved for us in his word an understanding of Jesus, an understanding of how the early church worshiped and understood Jesus in such a way that we can know him, not just know facts about him him, but that we can truly know him. And so one of the things that I love about this passage in Philippians is its context, because it helps us to understand how the early church understood and worshiped Jesus. The church of Philippi, you'll be reminded, in Acts chapter 16 was founded by Paul on his second mission journey. He's praying with his companions and Lydia, a merchant there, hears those prayers and is drawn to the gospel by the way they pray, and she becomes a believer. Paul and Silas are arrested, and they're in the Philippian jail there. And what's their response to being arrested? They worship. 
Their worship could not be contained to a church service or uh, just when everything was going well. Instead, they worship, and the Spirit moves in such a powerful way that even the Philippian jailer and his household become followers of Jesus. So you had a largely Gentile church there in Philippi. And just like every other church, that church faced challenges. We get a hint of it in this book in chapter 4, where it calls out the name of two women who apparently who are at odds with each other, right? That never happens in our church today. And the whole church was taking sides, apparently. And so in those first verses that I read, you hear Paul appealing, calling for unity in the church. But to that end, in order for the church to be unified, for them to be on the same page, Paul appeals what? Not to psychology, not to like group dynamics, not to the resources that he has as a spiritual leader riding from prison in Rome. Instead, he appeals over and over to what we have in Christ. Make your attitude like that of Christ Jesus. And so Paul gives us, either he wrote down or he gives us uh, one of the early songs that the church was singing. Our worship is important. The songs we sang today, you heard uh, the name of Jesus and names for Jesus over and over again. Why? Because we want to embed those truths in who we are. The reality is, is if I quizzed you guys about what you believe, you would be able to recite a few verses to me. You might be able to come up with a couple of doctrines. But if I ask you to recite the songs that we regularly sing, you would be able to name many of them word for word. Why? Because there is a power in music and in the words. And when they come together, it leaves an impression on us in a powerful way. So it's important that we look at this, one of the first hymns of the church, and we understand what the early church believed about Jesus. It's important that we rightly interpret those hymns, right? You've all heard the stories of people who have misheard lyrics that are popular in our culture to this day, right? You've heard the song by the monkeys, then I saw her face, now I'm a believer. It means something altogether different if you've heard that, as many have, and you hear the words, then I saw her face, now I'm going to leave her, right? Totally different meaning. When we were kids, my brothers and I, we were athletes. We often heard the Queen rock anthem. You know, we will rock you at ball games and things. And my little brother, instead of the line kicking your can all over the place, he thought it said kicking your cat all over the place, right? Vastly different interpretation and meaning there. Any classic rock fans in the house? Anybody here today? All right. Oh, I love the way in church you guys are like, yeah, I listen to classic rock sometimes. Oh, did anybody see me? Okay, Creed's Clearwater Revival, right? There's a bad moon rising. That famous song, some people have heard it to say, there's a bathroom on the right. (laughs) If you mishear it, you're gonna miss it. So don't miss here one of the earliest uh, worship songs that we have in the church. One of the earliest worship songs is right here. It's why in a lot of your Bibles it's set apart and it gives us three powerful truths about how, who they understood Jesus to be. The first one was this, was that he is the eternal son. Jesus is the eternal son. It says, who existing in the form of God. One theologian says you can translate that because he was in the very nature God. So you'll see a lot of different words that are used as we try to get our English language around the way that this was carefully written. But the understanding here is that Jesus is God. Jesus wasn't somebody who was created by God. There was a survey done by Lifeway Worship uh, about a year ago in which 71% of self-describing evangelical Christians said, agreed with the statement, Jesus was the first and greatest being created by God. Uh Uh-oh. No, Jesus is the eternal son, God in the flesh. But existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. So when the time came for him to fulfill his mission, when the father said go, Jesus didn't hold on to the God card. He didn't stop being God in any way, shape, or form. But instead, number two, He is the emptied servant. 
verses 7 and 8. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself. We pause there for a moment because when we think about what Jesus endured for us, we automatically jump to the cross, and rightfully so. We'll get there in just a moment. But we forget what a humiliation it was for him to be incarnated as a man. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be the eternal God with all the splendors of heaven, with all the power in the universe, and for you to step out of heaven and into time and space and history and take on the likeness of a man to come into our mess? Who would choose that? Jesus did. And so not only did he do that, but he also, what? He became obedient to the point of death, even death on earth. A cross, not only the physical pain, of course, but the spiritual pain and anguish he went through as he who knew no sin took on the sin of the world, as he bared the wrath of God's holy hatred for all time against sin and evil in himself. The Jews believed you were cursed if you hung on a tree. The Romans themselves thought this form of torture and death to be so barbaric that they wouldn't even talk about it in polite company. And yet this is what our God did for us. He stepped out of heaven into time and space, identified with us, took on our likeness, in other words, fully God and yet fully man, so that he could fulfill the mission that the Father had given to him of dying, paying the penalty for our sin on the cross. So from the depths of the depths, now all of a sudden the song takes off to the highest of heights. So because of his obedience, what happened? For this reason, God highly exalted him. So number three, Jesus is now the exalted Lord the Lord of all. The word there, highly exalted, literally super exalted him. And he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Pause there. Does it say every believer will bow? Does it say every disciple of Jesus will bow? No. It says every knee will bow. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, because for those of us who are in Jesus Christ, right, that's a good thing. Here comes our king to reign and to rule. And so we gladly bend the knee. We submit to him. He is our king. But did you realize in the second coming on the day that he returns, every knee will bow. Those believers will go to be with him forever. Those who don't, it will be too late. They will be forced to bend the knee and to declare that Jesus is God. They are not, but for them it will be too late and they will spend an eternity in hell separated from him. So there, brothers and sisters, is the motivation for our witness, the reason why we must go. Why? Because one day every knee will bow. And it's our mission to point people to the exalted Christ who stepped out of heaven and into earth to pay the penalty for us so that we could be restored to him. It's the essence of the gospel and everything hinges on it. Remember as we've been talking about in this series that God has revealed himself generally in creation, specifically and specially in his word, but ultimately in the person of Jesus So how you respond to him, everything hinges upon that decision. And you can sing the songs and you can go through the motions, but especially in American culture, it's popular to try to sit on the fence. Consider the things that Jesus has to say. He's a good moral teacher. He was a social revolutionary. He really was for the underdog, right? And our world patronizes the person of Jesus not realizing the whole time that they do that, they're not truly honoring him. Why? Because he might be on their lips, but he is far from their heart. So the question comes to me and you today, who do you say that I am? Because literally everything hinges on it. Do you see what's happening in this letter to the Philippians? 
Paul is giving the same answer that 2,000 years later we're still giving. You've got an issue with unity. You're not getting along with someone. Well, what's the answer? Well, we need to put you in a group and we need to get you to hug each other. The answer is Jesus. Make your attitude like that of Christ Jesus. And when you realize his humility, you won't have pride in your heart any longer when you follow that kind of example. Well, pastor, I've got issues with my marriage or my family, and it's just so hard. And man, you just don't. The answer is Jesus. Make your attitude like that of Christ Jesus. The answer is Jesus. Well, you see, I've got trouble with work, and I've got all these issues. The answer is Jesus. I'm struggling with grief and doubt. The answer is Jesus. Make your attitude like that of Christ Jesus. You see, in the gospel, we never get over Jesus. God only takes us deeper and deeper into what it means to know him, to apply his ways and his truth to every single facet and component of our lives. It's why we need to know his word in the way that we do. It's why we need to be close to it. It's because by his word, we know him, and we are shaped and we're molded into a pattern that follows after him because literally everything hinges on it. And I know it might seem cliche for a pastor to stand up in front of you and say, Jesus is the answer. But guess what? He is. I know no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father except through him. And it's why this moment is so important for us as well. Because we come to the Lord's Supper, and that's where we find the one thing that Paul says matters the most. You see, we all come from different backgrounds, different life experiences, different preferences, all of those kind of things. But Paul says, where you find your togetherness as a people is in me. Where you find your hope is in me. Where my buddy Nathan fi- found life and truth that he was declaring today to us was in Jesus. And so it's at his table that we come together to be reminded that God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. I want you to bow your heads this morning as the deacons come and they prepare to serve us. And I want you to consider that question that Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Do you know him as the eternal son, as the empty servant, as the exalted Lord. If you do, then that's what we're going to celebrate in this moment, that because Jesus humbled himself, we could know him and we could have life. Without it, we've got no hope. We've got nothing. But in him, we can be reconciled to God. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, then this moment is for you. As the plate comes by, be sure you get both cups. They're cupped together, the bread and the juice. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, then we humbly ask you to use this time to reflect on the words that are being sung on the scripture that we've taught today. Because our greatest hope is that you would know Jesus as your Savior. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the powerful words that the early church used to worship you. God, thank you for what they remind us about your true nature and character. And Father, today we come together at the table recognizing that it's in you that we are one. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things.